to make sure for everybody who's here to give you basically an overview or a flavor of the, of the types of things that you can do with a scanning electron microscope and a high level um, uh, walk through the workflows for sample preparation of the different modes. And what I hope that you learn out of this is that you'll learn some of the more common sample prep techniques. Um, I also will include some of the challenges um, that can limit uh, the results from your sample preparation and, and how do how do we uh, uh, address that? And thirdly, um, towards the end of my presentation, I want you to, to be familiar with the building blocks for volume EM. And I have this little cartoon of Legos here because, you know, to be honest with you, if, if you're doing EM for, for long, you realize that there are many, many different protocols and many variations out there. But if I give you these fundamental building blocks, you should be able to, to come in uh, maybe yourself and, and try some of these if you haven't before. And I also wanted to note on here, there's a QR code that will bring you to the landing page of Zeiss, and it will have a video a recording of this presentation and some other um, useful um, uh, documents that uh, may help you in your, in, in your exploration of SCM for these protocols. So one of the things that I wanted to think about for, for you to think about for scanning electron microscopy is that it, it is highly versatile. Uh, in fact, I have some examples of the types of images that you can acquire. You can do surface imaging of the, your samples. You can do negative staining, which is a, a common technique for transmission EM. Uh, you can work with resin embedded samples. And of course, you can make these high resolution um, volume electron microscopy data sets. And I'm going to talk about those different uh, types of, of, of um, techniques uh, and, and how to achieve it. But as you can see here, there's just high versatility in what you can uh, perform. The other thing that SEMs are very good at is automation. And so a lot of times when you're collecting, you know, repeated types of experiments or, uh, um, uh, you know, lots of sections uh, or large areas of your sample, within a few minutes, you can set it up to perform those, and then you can walk away and the system can do it in an automated way. And I just want to make sure I emphasize that for you. So the main uh, um, te techniques that I will talk about today are sample surface imaging, correlative microscopy, negative staining, resin embedded specimen uh, uh, techniques, and then the 3D volume EM. So let's start off with sample surface imaging. And I thought it would be useful. Um, Aubrey gave a presentation several weeks ago um, that's also recorded. So if, if you don't have the, the basic background, but just in case there's folks that are kind of new to this concept or would you know kind of reinforce it, um, of course you have your electron microscope and you have your sample. And on this sample here, I just have some little cell life science cells, if you want to call it that. When the electron beam comes down. Um, the beam will interact with the sample and produce um, many different types of interactions, but one of them is called secondary electrons. And the secondary electrons, when the beam hits the sample, will be produced very near the surface of the sample. They're lower energy, and so there's special detectors that can actually uh, differentiate that. One of them is this chamber secondary electron detector. And sometimes also <clears throat> the systems can have secondary electron detectors um, within the column itself, and they can detect different forms of, of secondary electrons. There are, uh, there are other forms of, of signals that are coming, but for SEM in today's presentation, I'll be talking about secondary electrons to look at surface type of imaging and backscatter electrons, which come from deeper down in the sa sample, are related to atomic number and give um, elemental contrast that we can use uh, to, to look at images. So we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, shortly. So this is you know, a classical scanning electron microscope image that probably the first 20 or 30 years, this is how SEMs are being used. This is an example of bacteria where you can see the, the septum that are being formed. And you know, the scanning electron microscope is perfect for a lot of these studies because there's a lot of mutant analysis where you can you know, treat your cells or tissues, uh, um, either genetically change them or treat them with compounds and see what effect it can have on the surface. And sometimes that's uh, really important. An SEM is a perfect tool to be doing that, and you can get these very high resolution surface details of the sample. But how do we actually prepare a sample to get inside of the SEM? You just can't stick it in there usually. Normally, there's some process for that. So what I kind of hear is a walkthrough of what that might be. And I will tell you that I'm using cells on a cover slip as an example. There are variations. I want you to think about your favorite organism or critter that you work with. Um, and it's just about, you know, what 
how would we handle and move it through? Those are just minor adjustments. Like I talked about the Legos and the building blocks. This one I'm going to use for, for um, living cells. So oftentimes we'll have our living cells growing on a cover slip. But important, remember, if we put it inside of a scanning electron microscope, it's going to typically be under a high vacuum um, because the electron beam will uh, not tolerate very well um, gas molecules or ambient pressure. So we have it under a high vacuum. So the sample needs to be dry and it needs to be cross-linked um, so that it's stable and um, you'll have a representative of what it would have looked like if it was in real life. So normally we use a primary fixation step. We would use um, aldehydes typically for this. So aldehydes, one of them is paraformaldehyde and the other one is glutaraldehyde. And these molecules generally are faster penetrating into the cells. They stabilize the structure but they're organic based, so they don't provide any contrast, uh, any, any much contrast um, for the electron microscope. So after we're doing fixation with the primary aldehyde, usually for a couple hours, we will rinse the samples and then we'll put them in a secondary fixative called osmium tetroxide. Now osmium is a heavy metal and it's quite reactive. It's very slow fixative, so that's why we don't use it as a primary fix. But it'll go in and it'll provide a lot of extra contrast in the more you know, cross-linking in your tissue. Once you have the tissue osmicated, normally what you'll do is you'll do a dehydration um, series, a graded series, and a solvent. Ethanol and acetone are two most common solvents. So you start out with 100% solvent and, uh, uh, excuse me, an aqueous base, and then you keep transitioning 20, 50, 75. Um, that can vary. And then, you know, the sample's in a solvent, but we still need to remove the solvent before we go in the SEM. So um, normally what we'll use is a technique called critical point drying. So we replace all the solvent with liquid CO2. Um, then we put the sample under a very specific temperature um, and um, pressure settings. Uh, it's in a specialized device called a critical point dryer. And that will basically allow us to, uh, to change the CO2 from its liquid form into a gaseous phase without drying or collapse of your sample. Because if you just took your fixed sample and you dried it on the, on the bench top, it would collapse. But critical point drying is a way to prevent that. And then once you're done, and by the way, there's all types of holders. So if you're working with samples that are on cover slips or samples that are loose uh, or large or small, there's little holders that you can put inside that will keep them from flying and floating away on you. Once you're done with that step, you'll then mount your cover slip and you'll sputter coat it, which is put a thin metal coating on top to make it conductive. Because in the scanning electron microscope, non-conductive samples generally cause artifacts called charging, which prevent you from seeing the detail that you want. Okay, so this is the basic overview. I'm going to use a schematic like this as I walk through some of the other deck techniques, and I'm going to just explain some of the differences you'll see. But this is the primary uh, way in which we, we approach this. And of course, you know, when you go in and look at these surface or secondary electrons, you get these phenomenal views. This is a little tiny mite sitting on the surface. Uh, I, I believe a plant, sorry, I don't have all the detail, but um, you know, the one thing that you'll notice about secondary electrons imaging is it gives you this very three-dimensional and very surface-like uh, view. And you can even see and zoom in very closely and you can look at even how these, these um, uh, little insects are attaching. Things that would be very difficult using other image modes and it's certainly the resolution of the SCM will let you see lots of detail. And again, also in cultured cells, you know, there's lots of cilia and microvilli that can be on the surface. Sometimes they're engulfing, uh, uh, undergoing phag phagocytosis. They're, they're, you know, eating something that's, um, that uh, they don't want in their environment. You can see all those types of things quite nicely with this approach. So very different approach. This is classical SEM types of imaging. The other thing that I wanted to bring your attention is, is that you can actually use uh, immunolabeling, a technique where we use antibodies against maybe a surface protein. In this particular case, it's E. coli. And you see the E. coli is the rod shaped here. Um, but if you have an antibody with a small particle like silver or gold, you can actually use the different modes. This is the backscatter where you can look at these high energy backscatter signals coming deep in of all the little particles. And then this is the secondary image. And this um, detector here is showing kind of mixed. I don't want to get into all the technical details today, but just to say, suffice it to say is that sometimes if you have surface molecules, you can use small um, electron dense nanoparticles to, to visualize them as well. Okay. So now I'm going to move into correlative microscopy. And I have to tell you, correlative, there's so many ways to do it. I'm just going to show you one today, and hopefully you can kind of get the, the notion of what's, what's possible.
So the first question is, what is correlative microscopy for those who don't work with it? <clears throat> and I usually define it as it's a, a sophisticated approach that typically combines imaging ca capabilities of different but powerful microscopy platforms. The most common form of correlative uh, microscopy is called CLEM, which stands for correlative light and electron microscopy. So you'll hear that term sometimes if you're reading through the literature. And the reason why uh, you might want to use correlative uh, microscopy is, is, is um, three, three primary reasons, for me anyways. One is you get different information. Of course, I showed you all of that surface information that was by the SEM on those previous images. But a lot of times people are working with fluorescent probes and they want to see something inside of the cell or on the surface or might be distributed differently. Of course, fluorescence, you get some chemical information. And, uh, and with the SEM, you can get the structural information. The second thing is put it into putting things in the context. So a lot of times um, for, uh, um, you know, you have large areas of, of tissues, but you're zoomed in with the electron microscope to a very small area. You can use correlative microscopy from one approach, from light microscopy, and then also show the high resolution imaging and show exactly where in the tissue you are. And you're looking at only a few tens of microns. Oftentimes nuclei start looking like um, they could be anywhere in the tissue and it helps give you contents. And then the third thing is finding rarer targeted structures. So this is one of the main reasons I do it. I oftentimes am looking at disease states and sometimes the disease, the timing of the disease, exactly when it's penetrating, for example, a cell uh, and so forth, I need to find those events. They're not very common. I can use correlative to screen with light microscopy and then go in and do the EM side. So it's the needle in the haystack type of thing. So here's an example where um, a scientist, where we were working on a project where the scientist actually wanted to look at scanning electron microscopy to see if there were blebs on the surface of the cells. But the challenge was is they, they was specifically wanted to know uh, if it was where this particular probe called an exon, which is an indicator for ap apoptosis. But if you look in this picture on the last, left, most of the cells don't ha have um, um, you know, the green probe on it. And of course, we can't resolve the blebbing. So what we did was we combined fluorescence imaging and then we relocated the same exact um, area and we can put it together and we can actually now go in and say, oh, here's where her probe is. And now we can look at the membrane surface and see what types of blebbing phenomena are going on. So this is an example where one technique alone wasn't enough and it was an, the, the, the um, specificity of the fluorescent stain, we could go in in the EM and verify it, okay? Now, I, I, I'm really going to talk very high level today, but I wanted to say, you know, to actually get that image takes, you know, a specific workflow. And here is an example. Let's just pretend that you had some cells. So we would grow them on a cover slip. In the case of the platelets, we would just put them onto a cover slip and within a few moments they would attach. Then remember, I talked about this primary fixation using the aldehydes. So we would use this aldehyde fixation um, to stabilize the materials. And then we would introduce fluorescent stains or antibodies to label some uh, the structure of interest. In this case, we used the Nexin labeled uh, um, uh, um, uh, against this um, protein on the surface of the cells. And we used actin, which is a counter stain that's used. We didn't have to do anything special. We put it in and it binds to actin. I will make a comment when you do these types of correlative workflows, you can't use osmium uh, or heavy metal stains or solvents up front, typically you have to keep everything in a hydrated state. So normally this is a two-step process where we would run all of this preparation, where we would grow them, we would fix them, we would label them, and then we'd image them on our favorite fluorescence imaging tool. It can be confocal, it could be wide field, it could be super resolution. Once we're done imaging, we can uh, then move on to the EM side. But I want to actually make just one, this is, this, this, Presentation will be preserved, but just in case uh, you want to go back and say, oh, he mentioned something about this. You know, taking a, a sample and moving it between the different microscopes means it has to be on a, a format that's compatible between two imaging uh, systems. So cover slips are, are quite good at that. But the challenge is, is that if you've ever worked with fluorescence before, oftentimes you have to seal uh, a slide um, or uh, um, uh, with nail polish in order to do your imaging uh, so that it doesn't get all over your microscope. It turns out that there's this material called picodent uh, twinsel, which is actually a two-part silicone, and you mix it together. And in about five minutes, it starts polymerizing. And the cool thing about it is, is that you can put your slide, put maybe 50 microliters of whatever buffer you want to mount your sample in to do your imaging, and you can you know, put this material around the outside, it'll polymerize, it seals it, and you can do your imaging, 
And it's kind of like a rubber mask, like you would, you know, you know maybe use um, in the movies or whatever. You can just peel it off and then take that co cover slip and move it on and do further processing for EM. And I just left the little instructions here in case you decide to try this yourself. So once I've done all my imaging, I can take off this, this um, reversible mountain of the silicone, and then I would dehydrate it in this graded series of ethanol. I would use this technique called critical point drying. By the way, critical point dryers, they cost money, um, but there are some chemicals out there that would have an, a near equivalent effect. One of them is called HMDS, where you can try it if some samples are better than others with it. Then we would uh, gold coat it, and then we would do our SEM imaging. Okay, so that's a typical correlative workflow. You do your uh, um, aqueous-based fluorescent imaging, for example, and then you would then process the sample further to get into the EM. Yeah. Okay. Now, I'll make a couple comments to you before I move away from correlative microscopy. Number one is, you know, if you find something interesting by light microscopy, sometimes it's only in a few locations. Um, and so software, uh, Zeiss has some software and, and, and hardware tools that would help you. So um, you can make, you can purchase fiducial cover slips where they have a known little marker on here with a unique number. Um, and they're actually coded so that they're compatible with electron microscopy. Indium tin oxide is a little thin layer that they put on the cover slips in order to be compatible by EM. And by the way, if, if you all have uh, cell phones on it, indium tin oxide is the surface that actually senses where you're touching on the screen. It's optically transparent, but it, it uh, allows um, also uh, the conductivity that is needed for an SEM to work, because remember, charging can happen, okay, so, and glass is non-conductive. The second thing is, is that, you know, ha having a tool like this is terrific. The other thing is ICE has um, a software um, uh, workflows that allow you to, it's, it's basically a correlative workspace. They're called uh, Atlas 5 and Zen Connect are two examples where you can bring data sets from different uh, fluorescent imaging mode and EM imaging mode. By the way, this little picture here comes exactly from this location here. And it'll help you combine those back together, but it also helps you relocate more efficiently, okay? And if you're interested in correlative, um, again, you can use this QR code. Um, Zeiss has some, some great uh, papers that actually describe in more detail than I can today in this brief presentation um, and uh, references to a lot of other um, uh, articles that describe how this approach could be worked. And there's so many different ways. I'm just showing you one example, one example today, okay? Now, another technique that can be used, um, again, on, on an SEM uh, is, called, is called negative staining. And um, if you haven't done this, this is actually one of the easiest. If I were to pick anything to teach a new user how to do on an, an, uh, on an, on an SEM, it would be negative staining if you have a stem detector. And uh, so normally we have a grids that would go into a TEM, which are about three millimeters uh, in diameter. And they'll have a thin polymer coating that's ele electron transparent. Um, it's called form var. It's basically a plastic. And then on top of that, they put carbon in a very thin layer as well. So it's electron trans transparent, but it gives stability to um, your, um, uh, your sample because they have to sit on something. They can't just be, you know, particles sitting in holes. So you take those grids and basically uh, I would either put them on uh, parafilm or dental wax and put a drop of um, whatever I want to absorb to the surface. And if you look up here, Commonly, we'll look at things like macromolecules, organelles, microbes like viruses. And I'm going to show you an example of viruses are really easy to do um, and they're abundant uh, uh, to get as well. So after you absorb your, your molecule, sometimes it's a few seconds, sometimes it's a, a few minutes onto the surface. You can then transfer it over to a heavy metal stain. There's lots of heavy metal stains out there. You can use uranium. I use um, uh, um, molybdate, uh, ammonium molybdate. Um, uh, there's lots of different compounds. All of them have slightly different properties. Um, and you just basically touch your grid sample side down onto the surface um, and you move it usually to two or three grids. It kind of washes away any of the of your, your critters that didn't stick. Uh, and then, uh, oops, I'm sorry, I, I jumped ahead. And then I take a filter paper and I just move across the grid three or four times that wicks away most of it. You want to leave a little film of your heavy metal stain on it and that thin film will basically surround the outside of the sample in a thin layer. And when the electron beam passes through, wherever there's a little bit more stain, it'll look electron dense. Wherever there's a little less, um, it'll be more electron transparent. It's very simple technique to use. And so if, if, you, haven't, if you haven't thought about from an SEM standpoint, you have your, your electron column, the electron beam passes through. So there's a special sample holder. And on the other side of the sample is a detector. So it's a transmitted 
technique where the, the, where the uh, electron beam is scanning back and across. And when the sample interacts with your sample, if there's more heavy metal, you'll get more elastic and inelastic scattering. Most of the contrast is from elastic scattering. I mean, there's no energy lost to the sample itself. It just shoots the, the, uh, the electron off to the side. And that leaves a dark area um, uh, on your detector, okay? Um, and then areas where there's little stain or no stain will come through and they'll look light. So what does that look like? Here's just an example of bacteriophage. Um, I think we got these from Carolina Biological Slides, um, Carolina Biological Supplies. So you can, you know, get these, and it's very easy to use if you don't have virus hanging around in, in uh, you know, in your lab. Um, but you can see the negative stain has pooled around the outside areas where it's um, uh, thinner or less dense. You'll see. Um, and if you look really closely, you'll actually see the banding pattern making up the neck of this this phage. And if you look at the resolution, you can see the SEM can resolve. And this is this the SEM can resolve below a nanometer, so we can easily see the spacings on here. So I wanted you to not think about an SEM as, you know, there's a lot of biology you can still do in this way, and you can automate it uh, again. So you can take lots of pictures of phase phage on it. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to switch gears, and I'm going to move into resin embedded specimen. I'm going to spend a fair bit of time on this um, because this is um, a really cool technique. Um, and so we've we've done surface imaging and we've done negative staining and stem imaging. Let's look at this other approach. So one of the things we have to think about is, is that when we put a sample into a resin block, the sample needs to oftentimes have metal staining already as part of its, um, uh, um, its process because it's the metal where the electrons are interacting and giving you contrast. So if you wanna think about that, the most common ones I have highlighted in red. So osmium tetroxide, you can see its atomic number uh, uh, here is 190. Uranium is 238. Lead is another common one. So these are high atomic number um, uh, elements that we use to stain our sample. We also can use um, iron, ruthenium, silver, and gold for different techniques. Again, part of it is to get contrast. The other one and that I keep mentioning too is the sample needs to have conductivity and they can help with that. Okay. So, if you were going to look at thin sections on an SEM, th the same kind of thin sections you'd look on a TEM, you would actually follow a process along the lines of this, where you have your living tissue and you need to fix it. I will make a comment. The general notion is that these fixatives, you, you know, you can't put a giant, uh, a, a whole fish inside uh, uh, of, you know, like a fish that you go into the water or so forth, because the, the fixative, um, is very, you know, it's, it's, it's just too much distance for it to diffuse through and do the cross-linking and so forth. So generally they recommend a millimeter cubed or less on a side. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure that, that that's known. I already talked about aldehyde, so we'll do a primary fixation over a few hours. Then we'll rinse and we'll do osmium tetroxide. And then we'll do a step called N-block staining, where we'll add, add additional heavy metals like uranium uh, to the sample typically. Then we'll dehydrate, but this time, rather than going in critical point drying and so forth, we'll actually put it into an epoxy, um, a resin. It's liquid when it starts out. We put it into an oven and we polymerize it, and then we have our sample um, basically memorialized in a resin block. And once we have that resin block, we'll do sectioning or ultramicrotomy. And um, if you're not familiar with an ultramicrotome, basically it's a device that will, you can put your resin emb embedded sample. Uh, and then we have what's called a diamond knife or a diamond bow. And there is a little diamond uh, on the end here. This is at higher magnification. And this system will precisely, the, the microtome will precisely move through a few tens of nanometers as you tell it at a time and start cutting very thin slices. Because remember, a lot of what we want to use on the electron microscope when we're doing transmission EM is we want the beam to penetrate through the sample. And so you have to cut the slices very thin. Slices are normally around 50 to 70 nanometers, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on your application. So basically this goes over and over and over again. It's what it's designed to do, a few tens of nanometers, and you get these long ribbons coming off. And it's electron transparent in this particular view, but this is the diamond edge and these are the sections in a long ribbon. So you can pick up that ribbon by just simply touching the grid down on top of it, and you can pick up these ribbons. Now, when I use, when you get them in a, in a ribbon form, and you image them, the technique of imaging long ribbons is called array tomography. So if you hear that word, 
It's a technique that you can create volumes, but you're taking all of these ribbons or their serial sections, and you can actually get them in long ribbons and put them together to make a 3D volume. Some grids will have little mesh bars on them that can interfere. Some grids will actually have um, uh, no mesh, but you can have them suspended so there's no interference um, from the bars. The other approach that you can use when you pick up the sections is that you can use a micro manipulator and you can actually pick sections and long ribbons up onto a cover slip. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few moments. Oh, one, this is a, a trick, you know, it's not easy to get ribbons necessarily if you're new uh, and, and uh, trying to learn and pick up the techniques of ultramicrotomy. Um, one thing the trick that I've learned over the time is first of all, you wanna make sure that the top and bottom of your, of your, your resin block is as parallel as possible. If they're not parallel and they're kind of like this, they'll actually come off in a curved uh, ribbon. The other trick, so you, you know, there's tricks to be able to make sure that they're absolutely parallel. The other part of it is, is that I actually use this um, three-part xylene, one-part um, rubber cement that you might have used in kindergarten uh, 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 to glue your pictures onto paper. Um, and I just put it with a little brush on the top and bottom. I let it dry uh, for maybe 30 minutes and then I'll make it tacky. So the six sections are more likely to stay together instead of falling apart. So I just wanted to provide that little trick, okay? Now this is a little bit, this is similar to what we do for negative staining, but you basically will take um, after you've collected your sections on a grid or a cover slip, you float them upside down, on, you know, a sample surface on your urinal acetate, and then you'll um, rinse, and then you'll transfer it over to lead citrate. Now, lead citrate is a heavy metal stain that I didn't, I talked a little bit about before. Um, you have to be super careful um, because if CO2 is present with the lead citrate, um, uh, it will form precipitates that are just kind of destroy the quality of your image. Of course, CO2 is from you breathing. Uh, so you have to be careful not to breathe on the sample. And normally there's um, CO2 scavengers as part of that process, which I won't talk about today. But once you've done it in both of these stains, process maybe take total maybe 30 minutes, you rinse it, you dry it, and you can bring it onto the electron microscope. You know, some of you may decide, oh, well, why, when, when will I use TEM grids and when will I use cover slips? Well, TEM grids may be fine, um, and you may already be comfortable with that. If you go to STEM mode, STEM is the highest resolution imaging of a biological sample that you can get um, off of an SEM. So if resolution is most important, you might use STEM. And you can use a technique called tilt tomography, where you can tilt many angles um, off of those grids using the STEM. Cover slips are great because you can do much bigger sizes. Of course, a grid, a TEM grid is three millimeters. A cover slip can be 22 millimeters or even semiconductor wafers. So you can work with much bigger tissues if it's important to your, your data. The second thing is, is you can get a lot more serial sections on a large surface than you can uh, on a small TEM grid, um, which makes management of hundreds of slices a lot easier because um, you can have one cover slip with hundreds of slices versus dozens of grids sometimes to get the same amount. And then third, I really like that thin membrane on those grids um, can break um, and then you lose your data. When you have them on a cover slip, they tend to be much more robust and uh, durable for archiving, okay? I just thought I'd give you an example. This is uh, um, an image of the slot in a grid and here's a ribbon of, of sections of, of brain tissue. And um, this is just an example of, okay, we're using the array tomography tools on the SEM to kind of do an overview map and once you do an overview map, you can start drawing areas of interest in your sample, which, you know, you can see all these little tiny boxes. I'm going to zoom in a little closer. So if we look at this little area, we say, oh, scan this at high resolution. And then you zoom a little closer, you can see microtubules, you can see the mitochondria. Um, and you can go even further and you can see synaptic vesicles and the Christi and the mitochondrial membranes. This is the synapse itself. So the whole point here is, is that, again, using STEM, you can get the highest resolution. You can see a lot of biology. And of course, with array tomography, you can now start looking at serial sections and be able to make, make a three-dimensional three data set from it, okay? All right, so I'm gonna switch gears. So I talked about um, uh, using thin sections in STEM mode, but also taking those same resin blocks, we can use array tomography on these substrates like cover slips, like I mentioned. And just to remind you again, we're using backscatter electrons to, to get contrast, okay? So the, the electron beam comes down and it's interacting with the heavy metals. It's the uranium, it's the osmium, and it's a lead that we put into the sample. So there's different kinds of detectors. Um, there's, a, some, there's sometimes a chamber detector. Uh, and then sometimes depending on your sampling conditions, you can use an in-lens detector. Suffice it to say, they're both looking at backscatter, which are basically 
uh, primary electrons that basically bounce back up, nearly straight up back up towards the, the system with high energy, okay? So I thought I'd show this little movie. This is actually using the Atlas V software. This is some samples that I prepared. I'm a plant biologist, so you'll see some of those examples. And it's just remarkable um, that you can go in and see all of this information. It's very difficult, if impossible, to do this on a TEM. And you can navigate around. You can see these are little bacteria. We actually wanted to look at um, these little channels between cells called plasmodesmata and how the bacteria were moving back and forth. And the cool thing about the software is that, you know, you can have these long ribbons you can draw a box that will automatically move into the same location in your long ribbon. And so now it's actually stepping through the, the, each individual slice. And you'll see in a moment, um, uh, each one is representing a different plane. And then you can put all of the slices together and make a three-dimensional movie. This is just a really quick and dirty way, but just to kind of give you a sense of the, of the power of array tomography. Okay. Um, actually, here's some work by uh, Jeff Lichtman's lab at Harvard University. They are actually looking at the connectome. And so they're, um, they've developed this incredible way to, to do lots of serial sections of, you know, within the mouse brain, a very ambitious project. And they can make these incredible renderings where you're going in and, and segmenting out and looking at the connectomes. I want to actually tell you something. These, they've done actually a lot to move the field forward. A lot of the tricks that they use can be done in very small scale. Hey, you just want to reconstruct some mitochondria or just, a, you know, a small part of a cell, an organelle level. Um, all these tools are out there and, and you can leverage them, okay? Um, I actually want to make a comment. Again, I'm trying to give something useful if you try to do this at home. Okay, there's always little devils in the detail. Um, one of them is, is that, you know, a lot of times when I pick up sections on the cover slips, I can just dry them down at 30 degrees overnight, okay? Um, uh, but if I use a glass cover slip, which is the cheapest thing that you can do, you will need to carbon coat them after so that um, your, your heavy metal staining is complete, so that when you put it inside of the scanning electron microscope, that the non-conductive glass doesn't prevent you from using the full resolution of the system. But you can dry those down. Some types of processing that I'm doing, uh, the sections can lift off over time. So I wanted to point out polyolysine at 0.01%, uh, um, or Vectibon are two ways that I can treat my samples so that when I dry them down, they'll be stickier through more extensive processing. Normally on glass, this is completely fine. If you use ITO, which I talked about, they're conductive, which is great, but they're not quite as sticky. I often just use polyolysine on the surface so that if, I, if you see your sections washing off, here's a protocol to do it. I won't get into much detail right now, but you can get these, um, they're pretty inexpensive, okay? All right, so now my final part of today's presentation is on volume electron microscopy. And I, I wanna actually just remind you the, the difference here. So there's, by the way, array tomography is considered a volume electron microscopy, but here I'm actually talking about techniques in which we're actually keeping the block intact and we're imaging the block face. So one technique is called serial block face SEM. And in this approach, there's actually a diamond knife or a microtome inside of the chamber of the SEM. And the diamond will come across and remove very thin layers and then the electron beam will scan across and create an image from backscatter signals. Again, it's the heavy metals inside of it. With a focused ion beam, rather than using a, a physical knife cutting it, it uses an argon ion, excuse me, a gallium ion beam, for example, and it'll repeatedly scan back and forth across your sample and shave very, very thin layers. Only a few nanometers at a time can be removed. And again, you'll image um, in the backscatter mode, uh, typically the block face, and you can build up three-dimensional volumes. Today, I'm not gonna to explain necessarily which one uh, you have to, for your project, it uh, really depends on what your, what your lab would need. However, I'm gonna talk about the, the process it would take to get them properly into the system. I'll make one more comment before I move on. You need more metal in a technique where you're imaging the block face. With array tomography, once I section it, I can put more metal by staining it afterwards. But when it's using the serial block face, um, systems, that's not the case. The second thing is that the sample is usually further away from the detector. And because of that, there's less signal coming. So we want to actually put more metal typically in these approaches to get good conductivity and better uh, contrast and signal. So um, here's an example. I just wanted to, to, to say, you know, before you remember, we did our fixed tissue. All the rules apply. We use aldehydes, we use osmium. One thing that you don't always see in normal transmission EM preparation is the addition of lead but it makes a big difference to add lead um, uh, as another step, staining step. It's called end block staining, where I just soak my bulk sample 
in uranium and then I wash and I soak it in a lead solution and then I wash and then I process it through dehydration and I put it into the epoxy resins. And when you do that, you can get these phenomenal images. This is using uh, the focused ion beam SEM. And you can see all the contrast that we got inside of the sample. This is all N-block staining. You can see the nucleus, the um, endoplasmic reticulum. And one of the beauties about the focused ion beam SEM is that you can collect isotropic voxels. This data set is actually eight nanometer voxels in every aspect. So it's X, Y, and Z. They're all eight nanometers in size. So no matter how you slice it, um, you can actually get the same looking, same quality of result off of the sample. And of course, you can make these three-dimensional renderings and all the organelles. So focused ion beam is really outstanding at highest resolution 3D volumes um, of, of um, moderately sized cells and tissues in this particular case, you can see. Uh, now, the, the, the nice thing also is that you can quantify this data when you want, once you have all this uh, together as well, okay? Now, there's another technique for what the, 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 the microtome version called serial block face uh, imaging. And the technique is often referred to as OTO protocol. And I'll explain that in a moment. There's a lot more metal that goes into these samples, but it really does make a big difference. By the way, this technique, the, the OTO protocol, can also be used for FibSem. Um, uh, it's just more extended protocol. It depends on whether you need it or not. But again, the same discussion we had before, live cell tissue, we do the aldehyde fixation, but here's where things change. When you do the osmium tetroxide fi uh, fixation, oftentimes there's an additional compound compound called potassium ferrocyanide. And if you think about the ferrocyanide, there's an iron. So now we put extra iron in the material. It tends to help in, in contrast uh, carbohydrates in membranes. Then um, you'll, you'll, you can then use a compound called thiocarbohydrazide, which basically takes an osmium. It puts the thiocarbohydrazide, and then you can put more osmium on top again, and you basically amplify. You're making a sandwich basically with the car thiocarbohydrazide. So it's called OTO protocol. Then you can do your N-block, uranium, and lead, dehydrate. And you notice my tissues become very black because there's so much metal in here now that it's made it really conductive, makes it great for serial block face imaging, um, and then uh, uh, also, again, helps on the conductivity. So here's an example of, um, these are cancer cells. And um, I'll, I'll talk about this in, in, in a moment, but you see this movie flying around. They actually wanted to know where the endoplasmic reticulum and the mitochondrial meet because there's a lot of data out showing that there's communication between um, uh, these structures. And we could use this volumium approach to actually look at all of these contact points and we can quantify it in a volume. This would be very difficult. Every one of these little dots is one of these contact points with the endoplasmic reticulum. Trying to do this in two dimensions would be very tedious by within you know overnight run, we can get several hundred slices and be able to get this data and quantify it. I also will want to make a comment to um, a lot of the machine learning and um, deep learning algorithms out there to train, uh, you know, what's the nucleus, what's the mitochondria, and what's endoplasmic reticulum. They keep improving all the time. Um, and so the segmentation is an important part of the workflow. I wanted to remind you of that. Um, and uh, particularly when you have larger volumes, it's been very helpful. Okay. So I'm going to circle back to our original slide. I, I hope that you learned about some of the common, you know, high level uh, sample preparation uh, techniques um, and some of the challenges that you face when you're doing your imaging and you're familiar now with the 3D um, volume EM workflows. But I will tell you, and I think maybe you can appreciate that, it's only the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more that you can do. And I'm sorry if I might have missed maybe one of your favorite techniques. I'm happy to answer some questions on that.